and welcome to another session of our seminar series, Topics in Early Modern Studies. We are delighted to have you here one more time and we hope you are enjoying the discussion so far. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to give you the house rules so we can keep interference to a minimum during the presentation. Please keep your microphones muted during the entire talk. We will have time for a Q&A afterward. Uh, please use the raise hand function to pose your questions. Alternatively, if you prefer, you can type your question in the chat and we will read it to the speaker. If you are a Portuguese, Spanish or French speaker and prefer to use your own language while making your question, please feel free to do it by typing in the chat. We are happy to translate it into English. I would also like to remind you that the session is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel later. Having that said, we are very honored to receive Dr. Jonathan Scott today. Uh, Dr. Scott is a professor of the History Department at Auckland University in New Zealand and he received his BA from Victoria University of Wellington and his PhD from Cambridge. His research interests include 17th century British political and religious history, early modern European culture and ideas, environmental and maritime history, empire and travel writing. He is the author of several articles and books, among them I would like to highlight England's Troubles, uh, 17th century political instability in European context, Commonwealth principles, Republican writings of the English Revolution, and how the old world ended, the Anglo-Dutch American Revolution. In today's session, uh, Jonathan Scott will give a paper entitled Ocean Road, How Early Modern London Became the First World City, uh, which we are all very excited to hear. Without further ado, I would like to thank you, Professor, for accepting our invitations, especially considering that it's so early in the morning in New Zealand. And uh, thank you for participating. Uh, well, uh, I will give you the floor now. Thank you, Veronica. Um, and thank you very much, Veronica and Livia, both for setting up this network, which is a brilliant accomplishment, in my opinion, and for including me and New Zealand in this global network. I'm very grateful. and. Um, pleased to have this opportunity to talk about what I'm working on at the moment. So my title, as you know, is Ocean Road, How London Became the First World City. My recent book, How the Old World Ended, which is still available from uh, all good bookshops, attempted to understand the replacement of agricultural by industrial societies. In so doing, it identified a trans transitional process, which I called Anglo-Dutch American Early Modernity. This was an Atlantic phenomenon with a global context and economic, social, political, cultural and intellectual components. In general, it manifested several characteristics, being, for instance, transnational, migrational, maritime, mercantile and revolutionary. My subject today, the emergence of London as the first world city, may be identified as a case study within this process, exhibiting as it did all of these features. Indeed, insofar as one of the most important results of the transition from agricultural to industrial societies has been the replacement of rural by urban life, an account of London might constitute an insight into both its causes and consequences. However, these observations do not fully explain my current project. That's because we must not think of the transition in question by which all human life has been altered as having been straightforward, let alone inevitable. On the contrary, it was in detail painfully disruptive of the existing order. That's partly why it was also long-term, complex and contingent, which is to say the outcome of no single personal social or political decision or plan. Yet in the conclusion to my book, I suggested that the Anglo-Dutch, that Anglo-Dutch American early modernity had both a chronological and a spatial center of gravity. The former was the year 1649 and the latter London, each serving as the conduit of longer term transnational changes, which together made them constitute a kind of turnpike that is both meeting place and accelerant of revolutions. Thus, the present study begins where its predecessor ended, looking into this vortex and trying to understand how it worked. 
In the first place, it's no surprise that seeking to understand a profound global transformation, we should find ourselves examining a city. Several historians have identified important early modern European processes of economic, social and political change occurring in precociously urbanised communities, beginning in Italy and the Netherlands. The developments in question, often associated with the spatial mobility of money, merchants and sailors, to say nothing of soldiers, were stimulated by resources deriving from newly established colonies and also by the intellectual consequences of interaction with non-European cultures as digested by educated and connected elites. The resulting changes are sometimes contrasted with the continuities inherent in the seasonal cycles governing agriculture, although in the Netherlands and subsequently southeastern England, the needs of rapidly growing urban communities also transformed the countryside. Yet beyond these general developments affecting urban Europe, it also seems clear that early modern London was not like any other city. Perhaps it's no surprise that at the heart of a process which changed the world, we might discover a protean urban fireball, which came to function as a catalyst, not only of national or regional, but global transformation. But what does that mean? And how is it possible? The initial answers to these questions appear to hinge upon the relationship between not cities and the countryside, but cities and the state. Specifically, we need to begin by examining their relationship to political authority within whatever spatial parameters that was exercised, territorial, oceanic, or both. In this respect, there was a striking variety of types of early modern European government, whether republican, clerical, or monarchical. These included city-states in Italy and the Holy Roman Empire, urban federations in Switzerland and the United Provinces, national kingdoms, for instance, Tudor England and Bourbon France, multinational federations, either dynastic, Habsburg Spain and Austria, the Holy Roman Empire, Stuart England, or parliamentary, the United Kingdom of Great Britain. In addition, within all, within all of these states, there were smaller scale corporate jurisdictions and beyond them, larger, sometimes global empires. In relation to these modes of authority, mostly traditional, but sometimes hybrid, ad hoc and innovative, the arrival of a world city signified maximum temporal discontinuity as well as spatial reach. This is to say that it was revolutionary. And so in the first place, 17th century London must be understood as the site of early modern Europe's most important and by some measures only revolution, at least before 1789. Even before then, when it was a peripheral European metropolis, Elizabethan and early Stuart London was notable both for the multi-directional global ambition of its merchants and mariners, and for the degree of their legal and operational independence. The subsequent revolution of 1649 was partly a product of the by then greatly augmented mismatch between the power and wealth of England's capital and the weakness of its crown. Its result was the unprecedented capture by one city of a major European state, resulting in the spectacular replacement of an agrarian multiple monarchy by a mercantile, maritime and imperial republic. Although superficially this regime change proved temporary, in substance it survived the restoration of 1660, an outcome secured, modernised and monetized by the city's collaboration in 1688 to 9 with a Dutch invasion and so with a militarily potent but religiously and politically defanged Stadtholder King. Even leaving aside the Anglo-Dutch revolution of 1649 to 1702, early modern London was unique. It was not, like Rome, Florence or Venice, a city-state. Notwithstanding their sophisticated cosmopolitanism, all of these had limited spatial reach or openness to transformation by the world, despite Venice's rich regional empire and Rome's jurisdiction over the global mission of Roman Catholic Christianity. Nor was London, like one of the cities of the United Provinces or of its dominant province, Holland, within each of which the constitution protected the power and autonomy of every city 
and divided its economic and cultural prosperity between them. This was so despite the pioneering role of Amsterdam as the first global emporium of trade, supported by policies specifically friendly to immigration, cultural multiplicity and religious toleration. Nor was London like Paris, its only European rival for size. Both were capitals of Northwest European kingdoms. However, the population of France was five times that of England and as elsewhere in Europe, in Spain, the Netherlands, Italy, the Holy Roman Empire, Paris presided over a grid of other, if lesser, major cities like Rouen, Lyon and Toulouse. Only in England did one city completely eclipse all others, being in the early 17th century at least 15 times the size of its nearest rival, Norwich. Moreover, the growth of early modern London was without comparison. From 55,000 people in 1560 to 250,000 in 1603, 400,000 in 1640, and 550,000 in 1700, despite a visitation of the plague in 1665, which killed 100,000 people. By the time William Petty addressed this phenomenon in print in 1687, the capital of a small to medium sized European kingdom was the largest city in Europe and the second largest in the world. By 1800, it was first equal alongside Peking, the capital of an empire with almost 40 times the British population, 330 million versus 9 million. Unlike Peking or Paris or Madrid, London was not simply a political capital, but, a, but also a port. Unlike Rome, Amsterdam or Paris, late 17th century London <clears throat> was not dominated by a clerical, mercantile or aristocratic elite, but combined all of these groups alongside an increasingly powerful representative assembly, many religious confessions and an array of professions connecting trade, agriculture, manufacturing and services. Finally, after half a century of transnational in-migration, London in 1707 was no longer simply an English city. It stood at the centre of a multinational state. It anchored a transatlantic Protestant Enlightenment culture, a Northwestern European economy, which was now the richest in the world, and a rapidly expanding global empire. Later, by means of the Industrial Revolution, it would help to create the modern world economy. In short, between 1580 and 1780, London slipped the bounds of the national. In respect of this development, I'm particularly interested in the causes and consequences of the city's unusual openness to the supranational economic, social and cultural forces by which the modern world was being ushered into being. Here these coalesced amid the cosmopolitan possibilities of city rather than nation state formation, in the context of a unique alliance between one city and a supranational Anglo-Dutch, Anglo-Scots and then Anglo-German imperial state. Within this context, understanding London's capacity to transform requires attention to not only its power, but also its permeability. The resulting history must be not only urban, national or regional, but global. It examines one city as a pivotal site for the development of modern society. Early modern Rome, Amsterdam, Peking and Mexico City all had distinct global roles. Yet none became a global city, in part because each remained subordinate to the power and interest of a larger state or church. Only London transformed an entire society, state and empire wielding their power to serve its own ultimately world-spanning economic, intellectual and political ambitions. In the remainder of my time today, I want to touch on six aspects of London's supranational historical development, which were political, economic, military fiscal, social demographic, bibliographic and intellectual scientific. All were facilitated by a maritime context within which the city became the primary hub 
upon an early modern ocean road which supplemented which supplanted the Silk Road as the leading global pathway across international borders. My political focus is upon London as a revolutionary force. The revolution of 1649 was an event in global history, not only because of its long-term consequence of reorienting the state away from dynastic and toward mercantile, maritime and parliamentary processes and policies. Over the previous four years, the city had witnessed an eruption of radical thought and agitation without European parallel. Escaping ecclesiastical and political control and co-opting the militarily triumphant New Model Army, this had confronted religious, social, political and legal oppression. Artic articulated by women as well as men, of humble as well as middling social status, English radicalism demanded the realization and practice rather than mere rhetoric of the Christian ideals of charity, community and equality. Although sometimes expressed in national terms, most famously by leveller John Lilburn's demand for the, for the rights of freeborn Englishmen, it was grounded in beliefs about universal human properties and rights deriving from the work of one eternal creator. During subsequent decades, this moral and intellectual culture powerfully informed both English republicanism and restoration natural philosophy, two subjects to which I will return. At the same time, more broadly, early modern London was undergoing an economic transformation from being the primary point of contact with Antwerp to which until the Dutch revolt, England sent most of its exports and from which it received most imports into a maritime northern octopus with tentacles spanning the globe. After 1600, the city replaced the West Country as the driver of long range voyaging to the Mediterranean and Levant, the North Sea and Baltic, the East Indies, Africa and the Americas. Between 1600 and 1700, the quantity of English shipping increased by a factor of five. Imports from America included tobacco, sugar, rice, timber and fish, and from Asia, pepper, coffee and tea, as well as Chinese silk and porcelain and Indian calicos. As one early 18th century history enthused, the, the improvement of navigation since the discovery of the magnetic needle, having made known to us as much of the coasts as Af of Africa and Asia as amounts to about 5,000 leagues, now all Europe abounds in all such things as those vast, wealthy, exuberant eastern regions can afford. Whereas before it had nothing but what it received at excessive rates from the Venetians, now the sea is open. Every nation has the liberty of supplying itself from the fountainhead, and these parts supply the Christian world with all gums, drugs, spices, silks and cottons, precious stones, sulphur, gold, saltpetre, rice, tea, chinaware, coffee, Japan varnished works, all sorts of dyes of cordials, perfumes, pearls, ivory, ostrich feathers, parrots, monkeys, and an endless number of necessaries, conveniences, curiosities, and other comforts and supports of human life. I'm just going to have a, a sip of coffee at that point. During the 18th century, the value of British exports to Europe, Asia, Africa, and the American colonies came to rival that of imports. They included a widening array of, man array of manufactures, especially textiles, furniture and household goods, metal goods, including cutlery and guns, and items for luxury consumption. At the same time, Britain became a leading participant in the Atlantic slave trade. At the centre of this burgeoning commercial economy, Londoners participated in an array of types of government, not merely national, but local and global. These included the government of the city itself, control of which had been decisive in determining the outcome of the English Civil War, the exclusion or restoration crisis and the Glorious Revolution. They included its courts and judicial institutions and other corporate jurisdictions, including chartered trading companies, joint stock companies, and in the case of the East Indies Company, 
global company states. In their administration, Londoners act, acted as citizens rather than subjects, organized in horizontal associations of co-option, representation and cooperation, rather than simply vertical chains of command. They were, moreover, citizens of the world. It was after staying in the capital between 1729 and 1731 that the French philosophe Montesquieu described England as a republic disguised as a monarchy. In this respect, he compared the city with two other contemporary republics. In London, freedom and equality. London's freedom is the freedom of proper folk in which it differs from that of Venice, which is the, the freedom of living in obscurity. London's freedom is also the equality of proper folk in which it differs from the freedom of Holland, which is the freedom of the rabble. The city's rise from national to regional and then global centre was not simply commercial but financial. This began with the transformation of its fiscal institutions to serve the military needs of a revolutionary government. Between 1643 and 1660, old and decrepit parliamentary taxes and royal fiscal feudal revenues were replaced by Dutch-inspired excise plus land taxes, while customs duties remained. At the same time, facilitated by a massive yield from the sale of royal, royalist and church lands, between 1649 and 1653, the New Republic quadrupled the size of the Navy. Meanwhile, the Plantation and Navigation Acts of 1649 and 1651, improved in 1660 and 1663, established the legislative framework for a transatlantic trading monopoly, which would thereafter be protected by naval power. Subsequently, between 1664 and 1702, a financial revolution transferred control of exchequer borrowing and repayment from the Crown to the House of Commons. This paved the way for a new instrument of public credit guaranteed by the legislature and serviced by a national institution, the Bank of England, founded in 1694, modelled on the Bank of Amsterdam, as earlier London's Royal Exchange, founded in 1568, had been on the Exchange of Antwerp. Offering higher interest than was available in the Netherlands, this turned the city into a magnet for international capital. All of these changes in turn depended on the creation of a constitutionally governed parliamentary monarchy. From 1689, Parliament met annually and legislation became more closely reflective of manufacturing and mercantile interests. By the early 18th century, British, Dutch, Huguenot, German and Jewish investment fed a symbiotic growth, both of economic prosperity and of state military power. Moreover, this parliament now anchored a state unlike any other. Early modern Europe was primarily governed by territorial monarchies and small, sometimes maritime, republics and cities. The former were culturally and socially aristocratic and the latter mercantile. But in the later 17th century, a new European great power emerged that was a territorial monarchy within which a landed aristocracy, enriched by the economic changes of the period, became fully participant in its new commercial economy. The way in which Britain's ruling class in both houses of parliament intertwined hereditary nobility with a mercantile manufacturing and financial oligarchy had no European parallel. One of those economic changes was a Dutch-inspired agricultural revolution which dr dramatically diversified as well as increased food production. Only this made possible the capital's explosive demogra demographic growth. Whereas 16th and 17th century Amsterdam had enabled its more modest expansion by developing the Baltic grain trade, London's grain supply was domestic. During the 16th century, the city's consumption of grain had tripled. During the 17th century, it tripled again. Yet after 1660, they developed for the first time an export trade in grain. In 1699, John Evelyn presented to the Royal Society a discourse upon English-grown salad grains. During the same decade, Londoners consumed 
each year 88,400 beef cattle and 600,000 sheep and in 1725 187,000 swine, 52,000 sucking pigs, 14,750,000 mackerel and 16,366,000 pounds of cheese. The transformation of English agricultural productivity made possible not only a further doubling of the national population during the 18th century, but continuing economic and social diversification. By 1670, only 60% of the English population was engaged in agriculture. In 1750, that figure was 46%. This reallocation of labour from agriculture to services and manufactures was crucial in underpinning urban immigration. Almost as important to the city's expansion was coal from Newcastle, burned at a rate which made the air unbreathable and blacked out the sun, not only for heating, but manufacturers, including after the great fire of brick and other building materials. Given mortality levels in all large European cities, large scale in migration was necessary just to maintain population stability. Yet between 1550 and 1800, the population of London increased almost 20 fold. An estimated 2 million migrants arrived during the 17th century alone. They came not only from England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. Between 1550 and 1750, Europe experienced the largest mass movement of people in its history to that date, both internally and among its global colonies. This was driven by economic and cultural developments, including religious war. London became a refuge for tens of thousands of Dutch and Flemish Protestants during the later 16th century and 40,000 French Huguenots during the later 17th. In the other direction, between 1640 and 1780, London was the principal embarkation point for one and a half million emigrants to the Americas. International arrivals worshipped in stranger churches, established new trades and manufactures, and became essential participants in the city's institutional and cultural life. Government ministers competed to attract them with economic incentives and bills of naturalization. In the words of one Elizabethan MP, the riches and renown of London comes by entertaining of strangers and giving liberty unto them. Antwerp and Venice by that means have gained all the intercourse of the world. The late 17th century city teemed with foreign-born artisans, artists, aristocrats, merchants, scientists, sailors, tourists, diplomats and refugees. The result was a social experiment on an unprecedented scale, creating a transnational repository for goods, information and services. In the words of Joseph Addison, countrymen and foreigners consulting together upon the business of mankind making this metropolis a kind of emporium for the whole earth. By 1700, the arrival of limited religious toleration for Protestants in 1689, the abandonment of press licensing in 1695, and the successful military containment of France in 1697, had helped place the city at the centre of the Northwest European Enlightenment. Sixty years earlier, England's civil wars had seen the emergence of a vast polemical pamphlet literature and the first weekly newspapers. The latter had their origin in the arrival in London in 1620-21 to of Carantos, news sheets which drew upon Dutch, German and other, other news sheets to report upon European Protestant fortunes during the Thirty Years' War. After 1700, London displaced Amsterdam as the print culture capital of Europe. It was in its print houses, taverns, coffee houses, bookshops, political clubs and learned societies, lubricated by beer, spirits, wine, spices, coffee, chocolate and tea, that the intellectual as well as the political life of the city acquired its flavour and perfume. It was by immersion in newspapers, pamphlets, books, learned journals, scientific publications, geographies and long range voyage accounts that London's citizens acquired a sense of themselves in the world. 
One literary result, Daniel Defoe's Life of Robinson Crusoe, Mariner, recounted the misadventures of one whose thoughts were entirely bent on seeing the world. Instead, for 20 years, a prisoner locked up with the eternal bars and, bo bars and bolts of the ocean, Crusoe discovered the divinely wrought reality of himself. Back in the metropolis, the bar-hopping, prostitute-bothering Scot, James Boswell, mused that, while a politician thinks of the city as the seat of government, a grazier is a vast market for cattle, a mercantile man is a place where a prodigious deal of business is done upon change, a dramatic enthusiast as the grand scene of theatrical entertainments, a man of pleasure as an assemblage, assemblage of taverns, the intellectual man is struck with it as comprehending the whole of human life in all of its variety. So my final subject today is the city's mental life, its view of the world and of itself. This found one expression in the Royal Society, founded in 1662, as a vehicle for the pursuit of natural philosophical ambitions with their origins in the early Stuart and Republican periods. These were not sectarian, but universal. Achievement of the society's ambition, which was knowledge not of books, but of the world, could not be the work of any one nation. Accordingly, the, accordingly, the society's first historian, Thomas Spratt, praised restoration legislation encouraging immigration. By their naturalizing men of all countries, they have laid the beginnings of many great advantages for the future. For by this means, they will be able to settle a constant intelligence throughout all civil nations and make the Royal Society the general bank and free port of the world. We are to overcome the mysteries of all works of nature and not only to prosecute such as are confined to one kingdom or beat upon one shore. Thus London would host not only the world's preeminent financial, but also its philosophical bank. Whereas other great cities, Babylon, Memphis, Athens, Carthage, Rome, Constantinople, Vienna, Amsterdam, and Paris all had their strengths, quote, Spratt again, it is London alone that enjoys most of the other's advantages without their inconveniences. It is the head of a mighty empire, the greatest that ever commanded the ocean. It is composed of gentlemen as well as traders. It has a large intercourse with all the earth. It is a city where all the noises and business, business of the world do meet. And therefore, this honour is justly due to it, to be the constant place of residence for that knowledge, which is to be made up of the reports and intelligence of all countries. For the same reason, universal knowledge must be the product not of a kingdom, but a city. The society intends a philosophy for the use of cities and not for the retirement of schools to resemble the cities themselves, which are compounded of all sorts of men, of the gown, of the sword, of the shop, of the field, of the court, of the sea, all mutually assisting one another. In pursuit of the ambition of these ambitions, the society founded the first internationally famous scientific journal. In volume one of Philosophical Transactions, Robert Boyle gave instructions on the collection of botanical specimens for the use of travelers and navigators. Responding to questions sent by the society, Sir Filberto Vanatti, resident at Batavia, reported back on the properties of diamonds and rubies, of cinnamon, camphire, Datura, durian, ambergris, the turtle, and the giant clam. To the question, whether there be a tree in Mexico that yields water, wine, vinegar, oil, milk, honey, wax, thread, and needles, Venati responded, the cocos tree yields all this and more. Later, having moved to London for the purpose, what is to be done will be done in London, one president of the society, Hans Sloan, assembled the greatest global natural history collection, partly by encouraging mariners, travelers, and others to bring hither the curiosities of every country. This collection he ultimately bequeathed not to the nation, but to the city. And if not to London, then St. Petersburg or Paris or Berlin or Madrid, 
for the improvement, knowledge and information of all persons. Only later, by the British Museum Act of 1753, was the collection nationalised. Establishing a culture of public correspondence, collaboration and experimentation, the Royal Society became a locus for interaction with scientists across Europe and the world. In the process, it made English natural philosophy the heir of a European scientific revolution, which had been in progress since the work of Galileo, Kepler and Descartes. One result was a series of spectacular publications by figures like Boyle, Robert Hooke, Edmund Halley and Isaac Newton, who did not content themselves with coconuts and clams, with the mundane world of light and sight, but used microscopes and telescopes to hypothesize about the physical universe. Perhaps the most spectacular product of this culture of discovery and of the society's institutional collaboration with the Royal Navy, the Royal Academy, and with scientific figures across Europe was James Cook's triple cir circumnavigation. Mastering for the first time both the calculation of longitude and the ravages of scurvy, this demonstrated a new level of maritime command. These voyages greatly expanded European knowledge, in particular of the geography, cultures and natural history of the world's greatest ocean. By so doing, they also reined it in, if not quite, as Andrew Marvel had said of the Thames, once a deep river, now with timber flawed and shrunk less navigable to afford. After 1780, it's possible to see the dominance of London itself shrinking. This might seem surprising given the subsequent century and a half of British global preeminence. However, that saw the consolidation of state and imperial rather than metropolitan institutional power. At the same time, the Industrial Revolution created for the first time a constellation of other major British cities. Around the world, the long 19th century became the heyday both for nation states and for global empires until the First World War. Yet perhaps none of this would have happened, certainly not in the same way, without the global maritime economic and epistemological framework outlined here. My focus today has been on an earlier period when one European city jumped the tracks of more customary economic, political and social development. More broadly, I've suggested that to understand the transition from an early modern world, which was local, national and regional, to a modern one, which is globally interconnected, historians need to scrutinise the world of cities and above all, this particular transnational, multicultural and multi-occupational civic space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Scott, for such a insightful and interesting paper. It was fantastic. I've got so many questions. But now I'm um, opening the floor for questions. Does anyone have a question for Professor Scott or any comments? Please use your raise hand functions or feel free to type your questions in the chat. Well, if no one's ready yet, I do have uh, a question. Um, I was wondering about what you mentioned about London being at the centre of print uh, in comparison to the Netherlands and, and Antwerp in the period. Um, how does, but I, I was just wondering about, in terms of uh, paper trade, uh, England didn't really produce paper, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that was most constant. In, in the Netherlands. How would that dynamic uh, would still put London in the, cen the centre of, of printing regarding the, 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 the role that, that the Netherlands and Antwerp in particular used to play in, in, in the 17th century? I just um, want to get you, Livia, to be more precise about the question that comes at the end. So I, I heard what you said about the paper trade, which is very interesting, and which might mean that even in the 18th century, London is importing most of its paper um, 
Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear enough. I'm sorry about my accent as well. I meant um, how how can in which terms can we understand London as you're proposing at the center of the European print trade, whereas it didn't really have the structure to to produce the materials that made print available in the first place. How how would that um, is is that more do you do you mean more in terms of the print trade and commerce in, in general or print consumption? Uh, considering that Antwerp and Netherlands still had that grasp around the production of the, yeah. of the paper itself? That's a very good question. So in terms of of the supply of raw materials, you've raised an interesting point, and I don't know what the answer is there. So I don't know where, for instance, paper in the early 18th century London print trade came from, and I don't know how that compares with Amsterdam. So that's interesting, and I will look at that. Um, what I mean, though, by saying that after 1700, London eclipsed Amsterdam as the centre of the print of the European print trade is I'm talking about the scale both of production and consumption. It, the city is vastly greater. Um, the constraints, most constraints on publication have been removed by the end of the 17th century. Um, and uh, so people like Adrian Johns have written about um, the, the change from um, the period before the Glorious Revolution where um, there's great interest in what's being produced uh, and printed in England, but um, there's also widespread piracy on the European continent of English publications by local presses in, in continental European cities. There's a change in the 18th century um, because the volumes of material being produced are such that they are able to be procured from the material produced by English presses is able to be circulated across Europe as well as within the city itself. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about the volumes both of production and consumption and they increase as the 18th century goes on. Um, so I'm also referring to local consumption within the city itself, which is now vast much bigger than any other European city. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments? Oh, Professor Phil has his hand written, so the floor is yours, Professor Phil. Thanks, Jonathan. That was uh, great to hear a paper about cities. Um, I guess I've got a question about causation, I suppose, ultimately, about why it happens as opposed to, to what happens. But I'd also, I'd like to ask it, by way of historiographical um, comparison and your story, say in relationship to Charles Wilson's story about L England's apprenticeship, which I suppose you call London's apprenticeship and, and the emulation of the Dutch and how the Dutch are basically a, a template for everything that the uh, that London is trying to achieve. And also Martin Prack's recent book about citizens without nations in which he sees a sequence of um, processes of urbanization um, beginning as well European urbanization but also in globally as well beginning in Italy and then England's is the kind of the fourth phase I think or the fourth mm -hmm. type and the key relationship is always state power and urban dynamism I suppose and I'm just wondering well do you see the emulative nature of English development as important in terms of what happens and is this a kind of deliberate um, set of policies which lead to this kind of um, preeminence by the 18th century or is it more contingent and um, multifarious? Do you see the Dutch as actually crucial in the story, kind of the elephant in the room in terms of what you're saying? Um, and, and how do you position your story in relationship to Prax kind of more um, encompassing story which always looks at this, which sees urbanization as a key dynamic in these different periods. Okay, know. thanks for that, Phil. I, I don't know the Prax book, so thank you for that. And I, I obviously need to read that. Um, but there is a, a large Dutch historiography about cities in order to understand what happens in the early modern Netherlands 
that sets what happens in the Netherlands in the context of what had happened earlier in Italy and is also happening simultaneously elsewhere, especially in the Holy Roman Empire. And that historiography does see London as, yes, like a subsequent third or fourth phase of this European urban process of development. So the way I situate London in relation to that, so I accept that, I think that's important and helpful. The question is, so I, I would situate London in relation to that early modern European history, but I've tried to suggest that within that context, there's something else going on with London because this is a city that gets, as it were, out of control and takes over a state and an empire and therefore becomes a global phenomenon in its own right. And in relation to your specific question, is this result, is this the result of policy or contingency? Um, it's, I think, the result of a lot of policies and a lot of contingencies over a period of time. I don't, I don't think there's anybody sitting down with a long-term master plan and the power to execute it over a, a long-term process, but I, I do think that the developments of the 17th century and especially the revolution of 1649 are decisive in allowing what is already a, a, a European super city, though it has a competitor in size in Paris to move itself onto a new historical track, which doesn't exist anywhere else in Europe and continue on it for the next 150 years or so. Um, now we have Professor Mike Braddock in the queue. Mike. Sorry, I, hi, Jonathan. Sorry, I really enjoyed it. Uh, brilliant, you know, the range and, you know, all that is uh, characteristically brilliant, really. And I, I should have taken my hand down because it's the same question actually about causation. Um, but I just want to pose it slightly differently that the you talk about frameworks and spaces and clearing houses and junctions as spaces in which action is taking. But I was less clear about who's doing the acting. And it, it's sort of an important question because when you talk about London being this or London being that, of course, you're talking about a particular fraction of the London population. Um, and, and many Londoners are not living an enlightened international metropolitan life in the you know, so I, I just wanted to press you a little bit more on causation in the sense of who's doing this and, and is it a kind of, to translate it into Brexit terms, is it a metropolitan elite connected with, you know, transnational currents or is it actually London doing it uh, or, or is London providing the space in which these kinds of groups are acting? So it's kind of no. the same question as Phil's, but, you know. Well, it's it? not actually the same question, but it's a question that m might follow from Phil's. It's tremendously important. And it's also very complex. So I think I have to say, Mike, um, it, in order to answer the question, who is doing this? We, I think we might need to be more precise about what this is, because there are so many things being done by, as you say, by so many different people. And you're absolutely right that in this huge metropolis of 400,000 and then 600,000 and then eventually a million people, there are lots of people living lives that are not remotely what we would call cosmopolitan. Um, in fact, one interesting thing about the politics and culture of London in the late 17th and early 18th century is the fiercely contested nature of what we might retrospectively call cosmopolitanism as a as a, an economic value as a religious value as a cultural value it's fiercely contested and it's very important it's a very important issue politically then as perhaps it still is now so you're asking a very important question about a very complex and important subject but to answer who is doing this we need to I think narrow down what this is. Do you want to give me a this, and I'll tell you who I think is doing it? Um, so, uh, one one really interesting thing you said. I mean, among many many interesting things you said was that this uh, junction and uh, you know the octopus was another image. Transplants the Silk Road. 
so so who's doing that 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 would be an interesting question who, well, who is, who's replacing the silk road with this this new world it supplants the silk road yes so i just i dreamed up this title ocean road um very recently while i was writing this talk out of irritation at all of the silk road ism that is um circulating in the in the historical world um i wanted to provide a refreshing kind of maritime ant antidote um i mean the silk i'm so i'm not an expert on the silk road but the 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 processes by which um, sea transport of commodities first across the Indian Ocean and then connecting those Indian Ocean routes with the Atlantic and the Pacific, you know, are complex and they are in process from the late 15th probably and certainly the 16th century through the 17th into the 18th and the players there are of course not initially Londoners um indeed um they are they include the Ottoman Empire and uh they include uh all sorts of Western uh European players but in the 17th and 18th century um the people who are creating what I'm calling a global ocean road are diverse and they include um, actually in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, um, merchant trading companies in particular, um, and all of the London based infrastructure that contributes to shipping in the city in which I'm very interested, not just the physical infrastructure, which is to say shipbuilding facilities, docks, uh, places to load and unload material, um, the uh, supply networks for ships, the, the services that make it possible to sell the contents of ships, but of course the whole financial infrastructure and also for instance, the publication infrastructure. So there are all of these specialist mercantile publications that develop in the, especially in the late 17th and 18th century in London where uh, merchants can check exchange rates they can see they can be told in short term real time when ships are about to leave that have empty hold space that can be used um, so the, the, mar the development of a maritime infrastructure is complex and, and, and I think fascinating and it develops really fast so I'm sorry for that rave. It doesn't answer any question, but I'll stick with the ocean road for now. Um, does Professor Mike like to add anything to to that question? Uh, well, I just want to emphasize it wasn't a critical question, but I think um, what you're really saying is London is a kind of inf a, a structural, a structured space in which a number of social forces are acting and you know it'd be interesting to know what the social forces are I, I, you know when the, when the book is done so uh, let, let me just add I, I think that's absolutely right and that's very valuable for me thank you and i will think more about that let's let me just add finally one of the other things that montesquieu says after staying in london for a while and being amazed by the way that by london as a social economic and political community and all of its differences from france he says uh, the extraordinary thing about london is uh it's all about money it's all about money it's what so, you know, um an academic said 20 years ago uh traveling to the united states for a conference you know you're in america because uh in the hotel having breakfast in the morning everybody's already talking about money well so montesquieu is saying that um, in the early 18th century, London is like that. And he's, one of the things he says about it is, um, he says, in France, he's, he says, uh, either in London or in England, I can't remember which, people will do anything for money, and that includes extraordinary, an extraordinary capacity for heroic and selfless endeavor just as in france he says people will do anything to spend money so in london they'll do anything to get it 
And in France, they'll do anything to spend it, including extraordinary and heroic and ultimately self-destructive things they will do. It's interesting. It's a comment about culture. Um, next, we have Newton Keek with a question. Jonathan, great stuff. And, and um, I, it's totally convincing in terms of the, the, the edict sense of what's going on. And I'm, I'm thinking about your long 18th century in comparison to, say, Jonathan Clark's long 18th century. And we can just say, well, Jonathan Clark is wrong. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it from the emic point of view of how, and, and this is a question, this is not actually, I'm not going anywhere with this except because I don't really know, is how do we deal with people that see this, because you just quoted Montesquieu and so on, and people that see it, and so many people that are not seeing it and seeing another long 18th century. Because Jonathan's got a lot of quotes too, and I'm just... Well, so let, let me, it's nice to see you, Newton. Thanks for attending. And um, so let me attempt a short answer to that question. We don't need to say that Jonathan's wrong. We could say that I'm right about London and Jonathan's right about the rest of the country. Oh. Now, I'm, I wouldn't say that because it is historically it can't quite be correct, but you could say that. So one of the things I'm... so. London, even at the end of the 18th century, has a population of one million, and then there are seven million other other English people and a million Scots outside London. So I'm not making a generalisation about Britain as a whole, though I suppose I am saying in my argument that London is in charge in various important ways. Anyway, I'm now depriving myself of the short answer that I, uh, I had in mind, but um, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I mean, in some ways, what you were saying, Michael, beforehand was starting to give that, you know, sense of how people are thinking about this and, and, and so on. So, um, yeah, thanks. I mean, Jonathan's thesis is about a nation and a state. And one of the things I'm trying to do here is disrupt national history. And in fact, it's pretty much all I've ever done in my entire career is attempt to disrupt national history, however unsuccessfully. I'm not talking about a national construct. I'm talking about something else that's going on and that's working across national boundaries and in different ways that I think is of global importance in this case. That's, that's all. Um, now we have a question in the chat by Michael Bennett. Um, he thanks you uh, for the fascinating talk. And he says that you briefly mentioned the slave trade and he's interesting to hear how significant you think the Atlantic slave economy was to the development of London in the 17th and 18th century. And if it was important, do you think that the shift in the locus of British At Atlantic trade to first Bristol and then Liverpool in the 1730s and 1740s is part of the reason why London is eclipsed by the 1780s? Um. Good question. Thank you for that question. My answer is it's hugely significant, is, the, is my answer to the first part of the question. Um, and yes, I don't think London is eclipsed by Bristol and uh, Liverpool, but those are the first two cities that grow fast and come to be important, I guess, metropolitan competitors. Um, in the longer term, Manchester and Glasgow might be more important as metropolitan competitors. Um, but I think the story that I'm telling about the, the development of London into a world economic and political and cultural power, the slave trade is hugely important to all of that in, in many ways, not just wealth generation. That's the short answer. And I, so I would expect if this became a book 
to spend quite a lot of time investigating that and talking about it. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, Professor T. Harriet has his hand written. Tim, you're the first person to have written a book about London among the people here. So I know I, ca I come you from a generation. Your advice. I come from a generation of Londoners. I, I mean, my question is partly follow up on what's been said by the two Mikes or two Michaels. I don't know. I don't know. Michael Bennett goes by Mike. Um, so can I push this a bit further? I come from a, a, a generation, generations of Londoners, and it, they're incredibly parochial. That might be a later thing with London's bigger by the 19th century. My, my, my mother's side, they all come from Wandsworth and Lambeth and never crossed north of the Thames. My father's side is from Tottenham and Hackney, that side. Um, and you can, you know, still today or still when I was growing up in London, you could place people reasonably by their accents, right? The Wandsworth accent was different from the top. Tottenham accent. So that's partly Mike Braddock's question, but I was wondering, picking up on Michael Bennett's question, whether, I mean, it's a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. And so um, it's not a criticism or anything. I'm just thinking whether there are perhaps different models. If you want to go for the economic model, maybe there's a network of... I think the last person. Have I gone? I'm sorry, Tim, we're going to have to go back a bit. I lost you in the middle. We lost sound it's, in the middle. It's, it's a, so whether whether there might be another way of thinking about it um, for your different elements you pick up here, um, the, like the economic side, maybe you're dealing with a network of cities that help establish Britain as a major global power, which would include not just London, but also Bristol and Liverpool, and then later on Glasgow. If you're dealing with the Enlightenment culture, maybe there's a different network of cities, maybe Dublin, uh, uh, just wondering whether it has to be so London-centric for this. Um, elements maybe there are different cities that come into play in different ways and that would be part of your story of contingency i suppose that there's no one central organizing causal thing that there are all these contingent factors that play into this yes so a couple of things i suppose one is that insofar as my subject is not simply london but london as a global city mm -hmm. And insofar as I say that a history of that phenomenon or claim needs to be not simply urban or local or national or regional, but global, then that history needs to be main, mainly about London's relationship with entities outside itself all over the country, Europe and the world. So it's not about London as self-contained, as I said in the paper, I'm interested in London's permeability. Um, that's the first thing. Um, yep. Secondly, I mean, I am interested in and take on board your point about the parochialism of Londoners. Of course, um, this is likely to vary greatly over time. I mean, I and but it reminds me, Tim, you're a Londoner. I'm the opposite of a Londoner. I'm a flipping Kiwi. Um, and I am talking about something that I don't understand or have any personal experience of from the other side of the world. So I think that's important for me to take on board. But even in terms of my own incredibly limited personal experience, when I first arrived in England in Cambridge as a student in 1982, London was very different from the way it is now, or at least was until it was yeah, yeah. Uh, set up for destruction last year. Um, it was, I thought it was a, a quite parochial and English city, and then it suddenly became much more cosmopolitan and global as a city over the subsequent 30 years. So it, so it changes. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, so I, I should stop there, but thank you for that question. It's interesting. I'll think about it. Um, now we have a question in the chat by Christopher Thompson. He asks uh, about two issues. One is about the radicalism of London in the 1649. 
in the 1640s, but the fronts in France and in Paris produced equally radical political arguments and far more tracts tracts than Thomason collected. Secondly, is he asks if your description of the continuity between the Commonwealth trade and commercial policies and those of the late Stuart state are not too schematic. Thank you, Christopher. Um, so first, I have to say that is, it's news to me that the front that the ideas of the front were both more that first that they're more radical, we would have to talk about what that means. And secondly, that the amount of you're saying printed material produced is more voluminous in Paris than in London. That's complete news to me. Um, so I need to know much more about this. Um, so maybe you could come back and say something more about that. Um, then the second um, question is, is my suggestion of continuity between the mid 17th century commercial policies and the late 17th century ones over schematic? Is that the question? Yes. Um, I'll take a punt on probably because I tend to be over schematic, but I have, for instance, in my recent book gone into a bit of detail about that because it's obviously a very important claim. It's also uh, a contested historiographical field, as you will know very well. Um, and I've attempted to document my argument there, but it, there's not a straight line of continuity between 1649 and 1689 or 1700. There's a kind of zigzagging line, but I would absolutely stand by, for instance, what I've outlined in my paper today, the, the fundamental continuities between both commercial and imperial legislation and policies, including maritime ones, um, between those established by the Republic uh, between 1649 and 53, and the early reign of Charles II and the later Stuart period in general. I, I would, I, I think the, the fundamental continuity there has been historiographically underestimated. And the same is true of the financial developments that cumulatively historians call the quote unquote financial revolution. So they might be over schematic, but I stand by them and they're important to my argument. If I'm wrong, I have to change the argument is what I'm saying. Um, next, we have a question from Veronica. Uh, Christopher, can you email me about the front? I have, I need to know more about this. Uh, can I speak? Yeah, sure. Yes, please. Well, I, 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 uh, I've actually looked at uh, the Mazarinard style of the 16th, of the late 1640s, early 1650s, and there are at least 45,000 of them survived to this day. That's more than twice the number of Thomas and Tracks of the 1640s, 1665. They've got a lot of material on restricting the powers of the French monarchy and uh, some quite radical uh, propositions about how the French state should uh, develop. And it offers a, I think it offers some sort of alternative actually to the line you've taken about the way in which the English or British state later on uh, developed. I think, I don't think France's development wasn't foreclosed in the mid 17th century, so on, which is in a way what I, you just hinted at, I don't want to put words into your mouth. The other thing is that uh, about the uh, policies of the Commonwealth and the way in which I think in, in a very long term perspective, I think this is true. One of the things which is important, which actually bears on Jonathan Clark's uh, which is the degree to which the position of the greater landowners in, uh, in the English state is actually solidified in the early to mid 17th century, which permitted this kind of rapprochement with mercantile interests to take place. But this is the vast subject we could talk all evening about. So I, won't, I won't interrupt your <laughs> reflections on other subjects it took too long. So Christopher, are you saying there are four in the, in the generated by the front, there are 45,000 distinct <laughs> publications, not <laughs> copies of it? 
Sorry? Different publications. There are 45,000 distinct publications that have survived. That's very nice. Okay, I didn't know that. That's very interesting. Um, but in terms of there being more radical, um, I mean, the, what would most interest me as a historian of republicanism is, is there any real republicanism there and of what kind? But when I claim that the radical culture of the mid to late 1640s in London has no European parallel, I'm thinking about a range and depth of radical uh, agitation, which seems to me to go far beyond republicanism. In fact, it has to be squashed by the Republic that's set up in 1649. And that is demanding to boil everything down, not simply liberty, but equality and an end to oppression across a whole range of social, legal, and other life. Um, a, a radicalism that has its origins in radical Protestant reformation of the 16th century, but that is squashed in the 16th century, that survives in, especially in the Netherlands into the 17th century, but the only place in early modern Europe and the only time in early modern European history where it gets out of control and becomes a major culture in a major city and then influences the culture of the whole country subsequently is England, as far as I can see. That's my understanding of it, but I might be wrong. Well, I almost am wrong because historians are wrong in the end, we hope. Otherwise, what hope is there for the young ones coming along behind? Um, thank you. Now we have Veronica with a question. Well, uh, thank you, Professor, for such an intriguing uh, paper. It was really interesting. I was wondering if these the aspects that you highlighted in your paper uh, when we are thinking about uh, the econom uh, economy, politics, or a communication circuit, if we're not just um, thinking about print culture, for example, but the, the broad sense of communication and other aspects mentioned in your talk. Uh, I mean, couldn't we also fit other cities as well in this category as, as world cities? Or, so why uh, London was the first when we should also think about uh, the experiences in uh, Lisbon or Madrid, or even if we uh, think about other places outside uh, Europe as China or India or the Ottoman Empire, places that had connections, broad connections uh, with all over the world. Uh, so my question is, how can we still uh, make the case for London? <laughs> it's a good question. It's an important question. I, I tried to refer to it when I said that there are a number of other cities and Lisbon, I could add to, to the list. I mean, there are a number of other, other cities you could add that have global roles. But I said they they don't become global cities in the way that London does because they are performing in relation to the world a limited function on behalf of some other more powerful entity that they serve. And that would also be true of Lisbon. But another question I would ask about Lisbon as an example, because you raised it, is when you think about Lisbon's world, is it truly global or is it, is it regional in the sense of being um, belonging to or describing or attempting to control one part of the globe because this is also p partly about spatial range and reach w what's your sense of that the answer to that question I, in my sense that i guess that there were attempts in a global scale if we consider uh, slave trade and also colonization and uh, commerce with india mm -hmm. africa I don't, I'm not a, a specialist on uh, Iberian history, uh, but I, I think uh, that if we consider other sources, considering like the slave trade, for example, or mm -hmm. uh, other communication circuits, maybe we can uh, consider Lisbon having this, uh, I don't know, this 
kind of global importance as well. But I don't know if any <laughs> Iberian historian is is here so, with us today. I mean, I think, <laughs> so I think the, this issue, the question that you're raising is tremendously important. In fact, in a way, there's nothing more important in relation to the kind of argument I'm trying to make. And so what I'm thinking at the moment, and this could be incorrect, is that there are a number of other cities in the early modern period that have truly global roles. What I want to say is different about London is that it, it's the only city about which you can say that it, its relationships with the world outside itself are so multifaceted and wide ranging that they are truly global rather than anything less than that. Of course, they're not completely global, but I um, want to say they're truly global. And also, I want to say that it's the only city about which you can say by the 18th century that inside the city also, there is a world. There are people from all over the world. Um, there is a level of global inter interaction inside the city that also means you can say that it's a truly world city. Uh, and to a degree and on a scale that's new. The other city that has, has the strongest prior claim to that status I mentioned in my paper, and again, I might be wrong about this, but I'm aware of it, is Amsterdam, because Amsterdam establishes its economy on a, on a model which um, requires it to have commercial relationships which are truly global and to admit outsiders from all around the world to, to facilitate that. And there is a Dutch historiography about Amsterdam as the first world city. Um, but I think apart from the fact that it, this is all on a much smaller social scale, it's a much smaller community. It's also more fleeting chronologically, that phase in Amsterdam's history and it's overtaken by London in particular in the later 17th century. Um, uh, and London takes that experiment further and moves it onto a larger scale, larger stage, as far as I can see. But thank you for your question, important question. Um, we now have a question from Stephen Carroll. Um, he asks, as London becomes greater in importance in the late 1600s, do Londoners feel the need to justify themselves as a particularly godly city set apart from other cities, a Jerusalem of the West? What an interesting question. I wouldn't have a clue, actually, about the answer, I don't think. Um, because most of what I've read about uh, Londoners' sense of themselves as global players in the late 16th century has not been in relation to that religious sensibility. So I don't know. Tell me, what do you think? I have absolutely no idea. I, just, I was just interested what you what you thought about it. If I might interject, I would say no. Meanwhile, you would say no. I would say no, but it's not my question, and it's not my 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 my, my talk. So I'm not supposed to answer. But I would say no. I think it's quite secular in this regard. Yes, I think it's and, moved away by the late 17th century. And it certainly it's certainly trans confessional. Um, I mean, it's one. It's an interesting thing about Elizabethan merchant voyages and also explorers and even the queen herself i mean i recently heard a very interesting talk about about queen elizabeth the first's correspondence with the ottoman sultan's top um female consort in her harem this um, very carefully managed diplomatic correspondence and exchange of gifts between them that goes on over a long period of time. So there's this very interesting outward looking complex and ultimately global interaction going on 
managed from London in the late Elizabethan period that's not fiercely Protestant as far as one can see. Um, so there is, of course, fierce Protestantism also in this story, but it's not, as far as I know, necessarily associated with a global, uh, a, an outward looking global engagement. It might be the opposite. Um, Ariel, did I see a question? Sorry, Livia, you're in charge. I'm sorry. No, uh, yeah, Jonathan, yeah, I, it's been a long day for me, so I thought I'd just type it, Jonathan, if that's all right. Um, I, you're okay with me. I've been at another conference the whole day on something completely different. You're a good man for staying awake. Um, I'm sure you'll have a good sleep now. So you're saying, what about Constantinople? I mean, what about Constantinople? And um, not on a global scale, but I'm, I'm constantly reminded by my wife's work on Naples that that is the most important city in Europe in the 1620s until the eruption of Vesuvius in 1632. Has a slave market, has major reach across North Africa, yeah. contact with the Ottoman Empire. Not global, but uh, certainly on, in the Mediterranean basin. It's, Italy's a different, because it's fragmented into different kingdoms and Naples is weird again because it's under Spanish occupation, except for the brief mass and yellow revolt. But that too has its radicalism. So how about bringing that into the conversation? Well, it is in the conversation. Um, Constantinople is hugely important. I'm not going to risk getting into a scrape with your wife at this stage in the proceedings. But um, if we, to say that it's the most important European city in 1620 means thinking about the relationship of the Mediterranean to the North Sea and their respective relationships to the rest of the world. And that would be a very interesting conversation, but quite a complicated one. But you're absolutely right, Constantinople, Constantinople is um, tremendously important throughout the early modern period. And um, until, um, well, in 1500, it is with Naples, one of the two biggest cities in Europe, and in 1600, it's still one of the biggest. But things begin to change between 1500 and 1600 in terms of the relative importance and interaction of European cities that might change that situation. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to speak on her behalf, she'll know more than me. But yeah, I mean, it's great to sort of bring in I guess all, all I'm asking really is one is whether we could recenter our vision, but we tend to sort of center our vision of global from the perspective of a Northern European, because that's the, the material we know, rather than focusing it, it from elsewhere in Europe, because that's material we don't know as much, at least yeah. in, in yeah. present company. Well, I think that's I think that's right, but I also want to say I, I'm not doing this because it's the material I know. Um, I, I mean, I don't, because it's the history I know, I don't think I am. Um, in fact, I, um, I'm sorry in a way that London is the city I'm talking about because, um, don't take offence, Tim, I've never liked it. Um, there are other cities that um, I have, that have made a massive personal impact on me. London has, has never been like that for me. Um, so I'm writing about it because I have to as a historian because something happens in the North Sea in the later early modern period and then in London within that North Sea and global context. When I worked at Pittsburgh, I had a colleague who worked on Ottoman geographical thought in the early modern period and reading her thesis, her brilliant thesis, it showed how um, Ottoman rulers had reconstructed a geographic understanding of the world that centered on Constantinople and radiated out over the entire world from that city. So they understood themselves and they understood that city as a world city in exactly the way that I'm saying London can be understood later. Um, it's just that the world, as they described it, actually consisted primarily of the Mediterranean, the Levant, and the Indian Ocean. I mean, they had a significant naval presence in all of those places, um, not the entire globe that I'm talking about. Great, thanks, Jonathan. I'll, I'll let other people come in now. Thanks, Ariel.
We have another question from Professor Bradek. He's asked, he asks if Lisbon is perhaps not less dominant in Portugal than London in England slash Britain. Is the difference Protestantism referring to your previous um, answer about radicalism? And if I may, I'd like to tackle on another question for myself, because um, thinking about Lisbon and thinking about how pioneering the unification of the Portuguese state was for, let's say, the launching of great navigations ahead of England. My question is, um, in a period where so much has been discussed about decolonization, um, how framing all these various processes that London went through, indeed, during the 17th century, in terms of it being a pioneering world city, contributes to our comprehension of world history in a decolonial perspective? I suppose one thing I want to say about that is it's not enough in writing a global history to talk about it in a decolonial perspective because the post-colonial situation doesn't apply everywhere in the world. Not everywhere in the world was colonized. Those places that were colonized were colonized in many different ways and they exist in the present in a huge variety of states of post-colonialism. I mean, New Zealand is one example, but, you know, and the United States and other places. So um, you're absolutely right that that we are all thinking across the world about colonization and decolonization and post-colonial situations. That's tremendously important and history is a key component of that thinking. But it's a real mosaic, it, even in the present let alone in relation to those histories. So it's not, it wouldn't be my starting point to frame this history. Um, now, what else? So the other thing that I wanted to respond to, but perhaps understand more clearly is to come back to Lisbon. What are you saying about, what's your question about the um, comparison with Lisbon and Lisbon's history? if the difference between this ratio between Lisbon to Portugal and London to England uh, might be Protestantism, referring to your previous answer about radicalism? That that might be the important difference? Are you yes. asking? That's Professor Braddock's question. I don't know if you'd like to. Brad, do you want to put a put a put um, an arrowhead on that arrow? Well, uh, it feels a bit uh, more pointed than I meant it. Um... No, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying, I'm trying to understand your explanation. I, I back to my social forces thing that yep. in your answers about Lisbon, you were leaving out Protestantism and Republicanism. So it's more a, a question about the distinctive role of England, not just being about its place in relation to its state, but also the culture that it was an engine for. And that, that in your view, Protestantism is distinctively important in radicalism and modernity and so on. But uh, it, it, it was a question about clarifying your view. Uh, it, it now looks like a giant bear trap because if you answer, yes, that's my view, you're revealed as, um, you know, terribly um, regressive force in global politics in the present. So. Uh, but I, I was just asking, uh, um, I, th I think that's the connection, is that if if Protestantism does become one of the social forces that is about progress and modernity, I, I'm guessing that what Livia is suggesting, that that looks like a relatively colonialising argument. I, I'm, I'm now putting words in Livia's mouth too. So, I... um, Yeah, OK, so I think I'm starting to understand what your question is about. Um, I can see people you, from I mean, non-Protestant countries are smiling in agreement with. The, I mean, the you know, I'm... Mike, that um, <laughs> in in my earlier work, um, I've really emphasised the importance of religion in general and Protestantism in particular. And in this talk today, the the only point of the talk where I have come back and touched base with that emphasis is talking about mid is talking about 1640s radicalism and the English Revolution, where I do think radical Protestantism is is the 
most important driving force. Interestingly, however, as I have been elaborating this broad thesis, especially in my most recent book, I've talked less about religion and my book has in fact been criticized for leaving religion out and neglecting it and ignoring it. Now, I don't entirely neglect it and ignore it because I, I say in my recent book that the religious relationship uh, with the United Provinces uh, and contest within Europe, first against Spain and then against France, is absolutely pivotal in allowing this broad early modern progression of events to occur. But I don't, I mean, even though I, um, I did invoke and quote Max Weber in my book, I didn't do so to say that I agree with his thesis. I did so to explain that I acknowledge his thesis and that it is still interesting in my view, but that my argument's rather different. My argument was rather more, for instance, about geographical and spatial proximity rather than spiritual incentives to accumulate money. So um, as I've become recently interested in economic and commercial issues, for instance, I haven't on the whole connected them to spiritual and specifically Protestant religious impulses. Um, and as my argument becomes less local and national and more global, that also might mean it becomes more supra or at least trans religious, trans uh, confessional. Um, I have to think about that. So I'm not arguing that London becomes the first world city because it's Protestant. Um, there are lots of other Protestant cities, uh, if that was the explanation. Um, the explanation is much more complex and I think primarily it lies elsewhere. The explanation primarily lies elsewhere, probably. Big thought though, big question. I, I apologise for my role in setting that bear trap for you. Um, now we have Professor Phil with another question. Is there time? Is that okay too? Yeah. So it's just it's just a question following on from I suppose since Veronica's question, Jonathan. I was wondering um, why you need the language of bestest or mostest or firstest in terms of um, on sort of describing London's development. Um, I think urban historians now tend to talk in terms of networks and so on, as, as Tim was alluding yeah. to, and this identification of a single city. I'm just wondering whether it's a, there's a danger of you're replicating the sort of the mercantilist triumphalism of the period in the same way that um, the Constantinople, Constantinople yeah. rule. Um, and then I suppose when, when you had this kind of, when this tri triumphalist type of analysis used to exist, it was with economic historians. And they tended to have the industrial revolution at the end point as th this is why London or Britain was important because we had the industrial revolution. And I'm, I'm just wondering what your end point is, what, what all this leads to in terms of the mostest and the bestest and how it actually sits in relationship to the industrial revolution as well, given that you have kind of brought in that kind of dimension to the way that you're Okay, so, so thank you, Phil, very much for that, because that's tremendously important. So first of all, there's no bestest here. I didn't use uh, the word best, and I wouldn't. Um, I'm not sure I've used the word most, but I certainly understand that there's quite a lot of mosting going on in my argument. Um, I defend the, the idea of first, because I think historians have to be interested in first, because we chrono chronology is something that we're stuck with. And if something really extraordinary happens, we have to notice it, and we are likely to want to try and explain it. So it is genuinely extraordinary that in 1800, a measly little European kingdom with a population of 8 million people has one of the two biggest world cities alongside the capital of an empire with 330 million people. That is something that historians need to explain. It doesn't, it doesn't make anything best, perhaps it doesn't even make anything most, but it is uh, unusual and extraordinary. Um, 
The final thing though is, it, my argument in my recent book about the Industrial Revolution is that the Industrial Revolution was not British, although it first occurred in Britain. It was the product of a transnational regional process that was complex, involved many different places and countries and cultures and accumulated over a period of th three centuries. Um, I would like that argument to be understood as depriving the British nation of th the exceptionalist story of the Industrial Revolution rather than uh, contributing to it. And to that extent, the story I tell is about networks and connections and so on. I just, I just think that given the historical process that we now retrospectively call globalization and given the development of cities and urban life in history, the history of London is historically very important and very unusual in ways to which we perhaps need to pay more attention, even if only ultimately to understand better its connections with the rest of the world and with other cities. Good question, thank you. Well, I'd like to thank uh, everyone that came up, came up with a question and a great special thanks to Professor Johnson Scott for being so available and eager to um, answer so many questions about a topic that is so intriguing, so fascinating, and um, also being so open to, to to criticism, which is, which is, I think is something really important in, in our profession. It was a splendid talk. It was so insightful. Thank you very much. And I would also like to thank everyone that participated today and especially everyone in the UK who was uh, eager to stay up late. But again, a special thanks to Professor Scott for agreeing to deliver such a great paper at such an early time in, in <laughs> New Zealand. Thank you very much. It was splendid. Thank you. Thank you, Livia. And could I thank um, both, both the organizers and everybody who attended for staying up past your bedtime. Um, this conversation has been massively stimulating for me and important, and I'm really grateful. Thank you. <laughs>